So, I got a little bit of review, and then the part one and the part two. <clears throat> Where is my your pointing stick? Yeah, I think so. My, my, my little pointer. All right. Welcome all, and all those on Facebook, whoever's watching, or whoever will watch it later. Okay, we've been talking about the gospel ingredients. The gospel ingredients consist of, at the very least, six ingredients of sin, law, judgment, hell, the cross, repentance, and faith. We are going through the cross. We are talking about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, I started on part one on the cross. And we started by going through 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And we learned last week that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God to all being saved. Next, we learned that the message of the cross is the full revelation of God. And we also learned that the full revelation of God is the gospel in all its fullness. And it centers around the incarnation and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The incarnation, meaning that it was God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who came in human form to live the life that we could not live. And that is part of the gospel presentation, understanding that it was God himself who laid down his life for the sins of the world, God coming in human flesh. Then we learned about the crucifixion, and the crucifixion was a painful and torturous death. To elaborate, it was a slow torture leading to exhaustion, dehydration, traumatic fever. Nails were through the wrists and through the feet, either through the instep or through the Achilles tendon. The nails were going through. And then it also consisted of a shame and humiliation of having to carry your own cross, which can be as much as 200 pounds that you would have to carry to your own execution. Now, Jesus, consider Jesus. This happened to him after falsely being accused, beaten with rods, whipped with cattle nine tails. Anybody don't know what cattle nine tails are? These long whips at the end of these tails have these uh, pieces of dry bone fragments attached to them, and that's what they would use to whip the prisoners. And Jesus received such, such a, a whipping. He was spat upon. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. A crown of thorns was put on his head. And I forgot to even mention, and I thought I would add, the Bible even teaches that his beard was literally ripped out from his cheeks. That was crucifixion. A painful and slow, torturous death. Next, we learned the cross of Christ was the intersection, is the intersection of God's love and justice. Why? Because when people look to the cross, they tend to look only at the love part. God loved us. He died for us. But forgetting to understand that the reason Jesus Christ had to die such a torturous and painful death was to satisfy the demands of God's justice. Hence, the cross, you got the love of God and you got justice meeting together. We looked at Isaiah 53, where it talks about in verses like in verse 5 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that we deserve fell upon him. All of our iniquity fell on Jesus Christ, the servant of God, the son of God. Verse 10 of Isaiah said, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Why? Because it was the demands of justice that God demanded. Verse 12 of Isaiah 53, we read that Jesus Christ, the servant, bore the sins of many. And not only did he bore the sins on that cross, while on the cross, while he was being mocked and ridiculed, it says he interceded for them. He prayed for them. And one of the sayings on the cross Jesus said is, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was part one of the cross. Continuing on in the cross and all that it entails. Part two, as I said, I have entitled this part two, the greatest, the greatest love story of all time. 
Now, when I say the greatest love story, I'm not talking about what Hollywood depicts in movies. Like, for example, the movie The Titanic, where two people from opposite worlds meet together, one rich, one poor, they end up meeting together, falling in love at first sight, and at the end of the story, unfortunately, the unsinkable ship that no one can sink, not even God, sunk. And eventually, these two people that came together in such an awesome place of love and commitment and, and, and just freedom in each other in their love, well, one of them ended up dying. She ended up going and lived her life and que sera, sera. Love story. I'm not talking about Romeo and Juliet where these two people met together and it was also a love at first sight kind of thing. Romeo saw Juliet and he was love stricken. Boom! I got to marry this girl. From two families. One was the Montagues, the other one was the Capulets. They hated each other. But then these two came together and fell in love. Unfortunately, because of the turmoil in their families, what ended up happening? They have to, they basically end up committing suicide because they loved some other, they loved each other so much they could not bear to be without each other. I'm not talking about that type of love story. Or my wife's favorite movie, The Love, The, the Notebook, where these two people meet together at a time where um, I believe it was at the 40s or 50s, I don't remember the exact time, that they got together, they separated at one point, they came back together, and the whole story is about the husband trying to remind his wife who got uh, diagnosed with, um, what did she have? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. So he would read the diary of the notebook that she wrote to try to bring back her memory, jot down her memory. Great, awesome love story. At the end of the book, they end up Loving, she ends up coming to, she remembers him, and at that moment, she goes back to the point where she doesn't remember him. It's a whole big turmoil. At the end, they end up, he ends up going to see her on her bed, and they end up holding each other's hand, and they die together, and they go together. Awesome love story, right? <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. What is your definition of love? What is your definition of love? I was once asked this. In 2007, I started working for the city of Chicago. I started working in the Department of Aviation. And during this one very um, rare time where we didn't have nothing to do, I made it a habit of trying to talk to people about the gospel. And I talked to one lady particularly who was having some baby uh, daddy issues. And it was one time me, her, and another gentleman who was a Christian um, she asked us this question. She said, what is your definition of love? And I stopped to ponder for a second because I didn't want to just answer just any old thing because today, unfortunately, that word love is just tossed around like anything. Oh, I love you or I love you. It, it's used so that we can get something in return. So having already spoken to her about the gospel, I didn't want to just answer just blatantly. I really wanted to consider this Loaded question, what is your definition of love? So before I answer that, I looked up the definition in Merriam's Webster Dictionary. I don't have it up here, but I'm going to read you the definitions of love by Merriam Webster. Number one, love is a feeling of strong or constant affection for a person. Number two, it is an attraction that includes sexual desire. Number three, Love is a strong affection arising out of kinship or personal ties. For example, the love a mother has for their child. Synonyms for the word love can mean affection, attachment, devotion, or fondness. That is the definition, those definitions that Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary has given me. Now, as I said, after giving some thought to this question, my answer was summed up with one word, a one word answer. And I came to the conclusion of this answer to this very loaded question by looking at the greatest act of love ever displayed, which is where I'm going to try to attempt to communicate. Because as I studied and researched and reread, and consider things to bring the teaching that has to do with the cross, that's always correlated with the love of God and the cross, 
I got a bit overwhelmed. I'm like, wow, this is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg of what love is. So, I will attempt today three things to, communi to communicate to you guys. Number one, I will try to communicate and show you the greatest act of love. Number two, in this one passage of scripture, while I will try to communicate that, you will see the gospel summed up in one passage of scripture. And not only will you see the, the gospel summed up, have any of you ever considered, since we started doing this series, why I put gospel in an acronym? Anyone ever considered it? Why did he put it in an acronym? I put it specifically when we first started months and months ago for this message today. So in one passage, you will see the gospel, and in that one passage, you will even see the word gospel in it. And lastly, I will give you my one-word answer that I gave this individual. So with that being said, please turn to John 3, 16. John 3, 16 is perhaps the most popular and most memorized passage of Scripture because, as I said, it sums up the gospel in one passage, and the word gospel is in it. So I was, during the week, Denise calls me and said, at work, she said, what are you doing? It's like, I'm, you know, working and kind of get my notes and whatever, whatnot together. I have time to do that as a driver. So I can do multiple things at once at work. So I said, man, and I shared with her, I'm very encouraged what I'm sharing, and it's just so overwhelmed. There's just so much depth in the love of God, in the cross, and how they correlate and they connect one with another. And I, she said, what do you teach? And I said, I told her, John 3.16. You know what it says, right? And she said, yep, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, for my wife to know that, it's something. It's a big deal because she tends to put things <laughs> together that don't go together sometimes. <laughs> But she knew this passage of scripture. Why? Because it is properly, like I said, the most memorized and most popular. Even children are taught. This is probably one of the first passages children are taught. And if you don't know this passage of scripture, wow, I don't know what to say about that. I already already said it, but let's go through it for the sake of emphasis. John 3.16. Everybody got it? Now, let me give a quick context, as I like to do from time to time. I don't just want to just go and preach from one passage, and sometimes you can miss some stuff in the context of it all. Here's what's going on. In chapter 2, Jesus just went to his first wedding, committed, I mean, um, uh, uh, not committed, he performed his first miracle, he turned water into wine, he started sh displaying his power of who he is, the Son of God, sent by God the Father. At the end of chapter 2, it talks about many believe because of his signs. Chapter 3 comes, there's a man named Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews. And the Bible, the account says, you can read it on your, on your own time, that he came to Jesus at night. And the reason he came to Jesus at night is because he didn't want the people, his own people, the Pharisees, he was a ruler of the Jewish people, to know that he was coming to Jesus. And he came to inquire of Jesus, and Jesus, we know that you are sent of God because no one who is sent of God can, come, can um, perform these miracles, these signs as you are showing. We know. And what does Jesus respond? In, chapter, in verse 3, he doesn't even respond to that directly. He goes right into the nitty-gritty. He says, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, for truly, truly I say to you, that unless you are born again, one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can one who is old be going back into his mother's womb. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. That which gets born to a flesh is flesh, that which gets born to a spirit is spirit. Jesus was talking about a spiritual rebirth. Nicodemus, being a ruler of the Jews, cannot understand how this can be possible. So he kept inquiring of Jesus. And in verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Then in verse 14, Jesus says, 
As Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and all who look to him will have eternal life. Really quick, what happened with Moses in the wilderness? The people were complaining. They didn't want, they were so sick and tired of the provision God was giving them. God gave them food from heaven called manna, and they were complaining. They said, you know, we're sick of this manna. Oh, we wish that we could be back in Egypt where we had fresh meat and everything that we could entail to eat. So the Bible says that God sent out a judgment upon them and sent these snakes into their camp, into their village to bite them. And to uh, the Bible says it was with fiery serpents. Not that they fire came out of these serpents, but their bite was so powerful that it felt like a fire, a burning in their bites. And basically, the people cried out and said, Moses, forgive us. Please intercede on God on our behalf. And Moses interceded. And God said, okay, Moses, go and make a, a, a bronze snake, put it upon a pole. And those who have been bitten by the snake, those who look to the snake, lift it upon this pole, they will be made well. Okay? So Jesus Christ mentioned this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What was he saying? Just as the children of Israel looked to the bronze snake on the pole and were made well physically, those who look to Christ, who was crucified, on the cross, will be made well spiritually and eternally. That's what was going on. So that's the context. Then, John 3, 16. Lord, help me. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, as I like to do, breaking down words, we're going to go through this and break it down as best as we can. So, we see here, God, the first word for God. God, that is which God? There's only one God, and that's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who made heaven and earth. And when it says God, it's talking about the triune God, but specifically God the Father, as later on, I will give a teaching on the Trinity. Really quick, the Trinity is one God, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three are equally God, yet they're not three gods, they're one God. So here specifically, the one true God of the triune God is God the Father. Now the next word says, for God so, the word so is to emphasize the intensity and the greatness of God's love. And then it says, for God so loved. This word is a word in the Greek. There's, I think, three or four different Greek words. I can only think of two at the moment. Phileo and agape or agapo. And this one is agape. And this love is a love of benevolence. It is a selfish love. It is a love that loves dearly. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. That's what he is. By his very nature, everything that God does is done out of who he is. It's love. Now, in verse 11 of 1 John, it says that God is the initiator of this great love. Go real quick to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, so you can see. 1 John chapter 4, and we are going to go back to John 3, 16. But 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses starting in verse 8. We're emphasizing this benevolent, selfless love. And it is a love that seeks the best of the one being loved. It is to love dearly. God is love, right? 1 John 4, 8, it says this. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. By this, the love of God is manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the atonement for our sins. Remember that word propitiation? It means to be satisfied. God's demands for justice needed to be satisfied. Verse 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. I wanted to show that to show you, to emphasize 
that the initiator of this great love wasn't you or I. It was God himself that before the foundation of the world, God knew us and set his love upon us. His love is gracious. His love was motivated to remedy our separation from him because of our sins. Now, how can we say his love is gracious? What does the word gracious mean? Grace, unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. God's love is undeserving. And how do we know that his love is so gracious? Well, let's look at the next couple of words in John 3, 16. It says that he loved the world. Consider the objects of his love, the world. Now, the world was what? It wasn't the world that he first created. The Bible says in the beginning he made everything good. But men fell into sin and brought death and corruption into this world. He created the world good, but now it is a world full of rebellious, God-hating people. Rebellious, God-hating people. Where does it say that in the Bible? I'm glad you asked. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The object of God's love was the world. And what was this world? Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, and then we're going to skip down to 29 and 30 just to kind of get the type of people. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And who are these men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness? Go down to verse 29. He goes on to say, just to emphasize, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. This world is one full of grief, strife, and wars, yet God loved it. God loved it. What kind of a being could love, let alone would love, such evil? I'm going to ask that question again. What kind of being could love let alone would love such evil. Let's go on to the next verse, the next part of the verse. For God so loved the world, what did he do? That he gave. Remember this, true love doesn't take. True love gives. And it just doesn't give. It gives the very best as we see in the next part of John 3, 16, that he gave what? His only begotten son. So you see God the Father, now you see God the Son. He gave his only begotten son. That word begotten means unique, single of its kind. It means only one. There was no one else like him. The second person of the Trinity took on human form to live the life that you and I could not live to satisfy God's demand of justice and in the process to demonstrate his greatest act of love. Next word. It says he gave his only begotten son that this is the ultimate purpose of his love. That the ultimate purpose of his love. What reason? Why did he do this? Next. So that whoever believes, whoever believes, that word belief means confidence in, trust, or to rely upon. It's not just believing in your mind, but with your very being. If you're on a plane that you find out it's about to crash, but somebody tells you there's a parachute underneath your seat, put it on, you're not just going to believe in the parachute and not put it on because belief Without putting it on and then jumping, it's not going to save your life. True belief is trusting, 
confiding in, relying upon whoever believes in what? In him. Who is the him? The second person in the Trinity who laid down his life. That is Jesus Christ alone. Salvation, the gospel, is always grace. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in who? Jesus Christ alone. If you add anything else to that, it's a salvation based upon what you do rather than what's been done already for you by Jesus Christ on that cross. That's why the difference between Christianity and Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, all these other isms, you put it in there, is what's been done and what you still have to do. Jesus Christ did it all. Then the next part. Trust in him, whoever trusts in him, whoever believes and trusts in him, shall not perish. That word perish, to emphasize, means to be destroyed. It means to be abolished. It means to be put to death. That is eternal death in the lake of fire. Remember, the message of the cross is to those who are perishing, foolishness. But where are they perishing to? It's not a, an annihilation. It's an eternal agony of torture and Weeping and gnashing of teeth, the Bible says, tribulation and anguish. You will not perish. You will not go to this place if you believe in him. And then lastly, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. You will have eternal life. That word eternal life literally means life of the age to come. Life of the age to come. In other words, Jesus Christ said in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That is life to the full. You can live the life that God wants you to have here in this life, but ultimately in the future tense, you will have the life of the age to come. A new heaven, a new earth, no pain, no worry, no more wars. All will be made new. That's eternal life. And it also refers to the resurrection and the heavenly experience that we in Christ will receive and will exist in perfect glory and in perfect holiness. This is the greatest demonstration of love, John 3.16. Now, the biblical definition of eternal life is found in John 17 verse 3. You don't have to turn there, I wrote it out for you. John 17, 3, Jesus is praying to the Father right before he is going to go suffer on the cross and drink the wrath of God. And he begins to pray and intercede for the world, for those God has given, and for his relationship to be back with him and his Father before he came into this world. And he says this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is not just quant uh, quantity, how much or the longevity of it. Eternal life is the divine quality of life that we experience by knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ. With that being said, I thought it was good to share also 1 John 5.20 to show you something very vital. 1 John 5.20, it says, this is the Apostle John speaking, the one who laid his head on the breast of Jesus Christ and to say, who is the one, Lord, that's going to betray you? The one that the Bible says, this is the one that Jesus Christ loved, the disciple that Jesus Christ loved, John the Apostle. He says this in 1 John 5.20, and we know that the Son of God has come, that is Jesus Christ, and he has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. That is in his son, Jesus Christ. Watch this. This is the true God and eternal life. Who is the this? The son of God, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And this is eternal life. So when Jesus Christ said that they may know you, the one true God... And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the true God, and he is the eternal life. So, 
God has performed the greatest act of love. And I have not just but touched the very tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of God's love. And I was intending to go a different direction with this message. And this passage came to mind and I said, I can't go into this until I talk about what we talked about today. So God willing, next week, we'll go into what I originally thought. But this is another foundation building upon the love of God displayed on that cross. So in conclusion, I told you I will communicate three things to you, right? I said the greatest love story. <clears throat> the greatest act of love. The gospel through one passage of scripture, that is John 3.16, and that within John 3, 16, you will find the word gospel in it. And lastly, my one word answer that I gave when they asked me, what is your definition of love? So real quick, just to throw out, let me ask you, what is your definition of love? If you can try to put it in one word, I'll give you a couple words. What would you say? Anybody? God. God. Anybody else? Your definition of love? Unconditional. Unconditional. Anyone else? No? Sacrifice. Here. You are my son. So I'm going to go backwards from one to three, three to one. My one word that I gave. When I was asked, what is your definition of love? I said, sacrifice. Because God showed not just the greatest love, but he did it sacrificially. He gave his all. He gave his best. What are we giving God? So that's one part. Number two. On the cross, God poured out his holy anger for sin on Jesus Christ. That's justice. So that he can pour out his grace and mercy on those who would believe in him. That's love. And that love is sacrificial. That love is the gospel summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. With that being said, the number one thing to communicate to you, the greatest act of love, I cannot fit it on there, so I had to bring my second post. post uh, yeah, my, my next board. So what is the greatest act of love? The greatest act of love, here it is. Herein is the greatest act of love. Are you ready? John 3.16 For God, that's the greatest being. So loved, that's the greatest expression. The world, that's the greatest evil of sinners. That he gave, that's the greatest act. His only begotten son, that's the greatest gift. That whoever believes in him, that's the greatest trust, shall not perish, that's the greatest hope, but have, that's the greatest assurance, eternal life, that's the greatest promise. God, love is great and can be summed up in one passage of scripture, John 3, 16. Watch this now, here is the gospel. For God, there is your G. So loved the world that he gave his only, there goes the O, begotten son, there goes the S, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, there goes the P, but have eternal E, life, L, gospel. Okay. G, O, S, P, E. L. Like my mom would say, son. The gospel. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Woo.
Lord, I thank you. <laughs> Lord, thank you is not and will not ever be enough. For the greatest love story ever told. The greatest love story ever displayed. Father, your word says that you demonstrated your love for us. In that, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, you loved us not when we were at our best, but when we we're all at our worst. You so love the world. A world that you originally did not create, but turned into a rebellious, God-hating people, Lord. You loved us. Lord, I pray. I don't have words. I really don't have words. I pray, Lord, that we would not hoard your love. That we will not hoard the gospel. That we will not take it for granted. That we, Lord, would understand what we've been saved from. So that we can do what we've been saved for. And that is to know you and to make you known through the gospel. And Lord, I pray all who have listened, all who heard, or all who will hear this message... That they would come to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Understanding that it is through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Help us, Lord, not to add to your great grace and love, but help us to walk in the reality of it. May we walk, Lord, help us, Holy Spirit, to walk in sacrificial love so that we may display the characteristics of our Heavenly Father who loved us so that he sent his greatest gift he could ever sent and give. And that is God the Son, Jesus Christ, the one where your word says there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ alone. He is God. He is the eternal life. Help us. Help me, Lord, to exemplify that. We are unworthy. Always. But thank you, Lord, for your great love wherewith you loved us. And you showed it. You displayed it. As your word says, you commended your love for us in our worst of worst. And Lord, if you loved us when we were at our worst, and though we stumble and fall short now that we are your children, how much more do you love us even now? That benevolence selfless love, a love that is dear. You don't just love us in word, but you love us in action. Thank you, God, for this great love. And help us to share this great message. May none of us be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. For all who believe. So I pray. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Before it's too late. And I thank you Lord. For this time. Thank you for the pleasure and the privilege. It is. To be your minister. Lord may you be glorified. In all that we are. And all that we do. To the glory of your name alone, God, through Jesus Christ, and in the power and help of your Holy Spirit, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Scott.